What's up YouTube, in this video we're going to look if the new Sony a7S III is worth upgrading from a Sony a7 III. So let's start. If you already followed my channel you might know that I used the Sony a7 III for almost 3 years now and I recently switched to the Sony a7S III for my video work. But considering the hefty price tag of the Sony a7S III the decision is not made easy. And hopefully I can give you an answer to that. But please consider that this is not a scientific test about image quality or whatsoever. This is my opinion after using the a7S III for over 3 months now in real world scenarios. Let's begin with the most important part, the image quality. And that will actually be the part that is the biggest argument for upgrading. Offering 4K in 24 up to 120 frames per second, the A7S III sets the bar very high. And the good part about it, you can use all the frame rates in 10-bit color and with a variety of different bit rates. So you actually can get high frame rates in 4K in a decent file format that will not overload your hard drive like the Canon R5. I mostly shoot my cinematic videos in XAVC HS 4K and 42010 10-bit in 50 or 100 frames per second because I live in a PAL region. For some reason this codec doesn't work in 25p but in NTSC it is also available in 24p, 60 and 120p. But I shoot most of the time in 50 or 60p because I can always slow the clips down by 50% if I need to. Of course for interviews I only use uh, 24 or 25p and then I switch to the XAVC as 4K codec. But the advantage of the 420 10-bit codec is that I can actually edit it fluently on my PC. The 422 10-bit codec instead is really heavily compressed and for that I absolutely need to create proxy files before editing. If you just film in real time in 24 or 30 FPS you probably don't need to switch because the 4K from the a7 III is already really good. But if you're working like me and you're mixing footage with different frame rates in one project in order to use slow motion it is great that you don't need to upscale your footage. And even if you export a video in full HD it's still a good choice to use 4K so you can crop and reframe the footage later on. 4K of the a7S III is supposed to be slightly better than the a7S III, but being honest, if you look at these two identical shots, you don't see a huge difference on YouTube. And now we crop into 200%, maybe the a7S III is slightly sharper. But what I find more interesting is the color and the color space of the a7S III. The white balance and the 10-bit colors gives the image a more pleasing look and in this example I shot everything on a standard picture profile and with the exact same white balance. But when you compare the 4K slow motion footage against the 1080p footage from the a7 III it's obvious which image looks sharper. People told me they don't see a huge difference in quality from my past a7 III videos which were shot in 1080. And that's because when you film with a shallow depth of field and only have certain parts in the image that are sharp like a person or an object they will pop out and appear sharper. The blurred parts in the image will not be affected a lot by compression and artifacts and that sums up in an overall better looking image. But in wide shots and with a wider depth of field 4K will always look better and having so much bitrate and frame rate options on the a7S III this was the main argument for me for upgrading. And when you shoot more Glein projects, you sometimes will need those options. One more thing I need to add about shooting 4K on the a7 III and that is rolling shutter. It can be a problem which you can see in this example. That was the reason why I shot faster movements on the a7 III most of the time in 1080p. But the a7 III instead is doing a really great job even in 4K on all frame rates. So if you ever struggle with rolling shutter, you might take that in consideration.
the a7s3 has a flip screen and the a7 III only a tilt screen. After using both types of screens, I need to say the flip screen is so much better in a lot of situations, especially when shooting on a gimbal. You can turn the screen in any direction so you have no more screen blocking by the motor arms, especially when shooting on a slung. And handheld is also a lot more convenient, shooting above your head or low to the ground. But I also used the a7 III monitor for a long time and I was totally fine with it until I got to use the flip screen. But that should not be the main argument for switching the camera, unless you're a vlogger and sometimes the flip screen can also be a little bit tricky to handle because in order to tilt it you always have to flip it out. One thing is for sure, the display on the a7 III is really bad. So it's a pleasure to have a sharper display on the S3. Enough about the flip screen, let's talk about the rest of the body. And you might think, well, it's just another Sony body. They maybe look alike, but the truth is the a7S III is a lot beefier and it feels so much better in your hands. The record button is on top and the new record indicator on the screen is very useful. By the way, this is an option you can set on in your menu. You will never forget to press the record button again, guaranteed. You get more custom dials, buttons, a better menu setup and you can finally lock the exposure compensation wheel. And I don't forget to talk about the EVF. And it's said to be one of the best in a mirrorless camera. And yes, it's so much better than the one from the a7 III, but the truth is I rarely use it and even for photography I most likely use the screen instead. We need to talk about the autofocus. The AF on the a7 III is already damn good. On the a7S III and Z, it's a completely new chapter. It's not only how the new autofocus works, I mean, when it locks onto something or someone, it just stays there. It's also the options and the functionality of the autofocus system, which makes it so great on this camera. It locks on a person's eye immediately when it sees it. And when you're further away with the camera, it switches automatically to face detection. You can now also lock it on persons or objects via touch tracking, and that is by far the best feature on this camera. But most of the time I use the AF on wide with face and eye detection on. Zone autofocus is needed when the camera can't detect the person's face and you have other objects in front of the camera that you don't want the camera to focus on. Another very important aspect about the a7S III is the eye and face detection are now working in every frame rate option. For some reason the face detection on the a7S III doesn't work with 120 or 100 frames per second and the face detection doesn't work either when you attach a monitor to it. But on the a7S III instead, it's now completely functional and with a monitor and 120 FPS. The A7S series was always known for its awesome low light capabilities. The A7S III has a strange noise behavior. Every picture profile has a base ISO. For example, S-Log3 has a base ISO of 640 and when you increase the ISO up to ISO 10,000, the noise will increase every time you increase the ISO. And suddenly when you switch to ISO 12,800, the noise gets reduced and the image looks much cleaner. On the other hand, when you use HLG3 for example, it has a base ISO of 100. And when the ISO is increased until ISO 1600, the noise increases every time in between those steps and suddenly on ISO 2000 the noise gets reduced. Which means every time you increase the base ISO by 4 stops, you kind of reach a second base ISO where the noise gets reduced. Which normally would mean it's a dual native ISO based sensor. But Sony didn't confirm that or denied it. So does it mean the A7S III is better than the A7S III in low light? Maybe. I actually didn't do any real world noise comparisons with both cameras. But all I can say is the A7S III was already pretty damn good and I never thought I would need it to be any better. So before investing into a new camera, first you maybe should invest in some really fast prime lenses.
I really have to say, colors right out of the camera look a lot better than from the previous A7 cameras. It doesn't have that greenish tint in the footage anymore. And the auto white balance became really useful, especially the anti-shock AVB. And what that means is the camera won't switch the white balance heavily when the scene or the lightning conditions will change. The auto white balance will produce a smooth transition in between when the camera tries to change those settings. This makes it so much more useful, but I still would recommend you to shoot with a fixed white balance if you have the time to set it manually. With the new 10-bit colors the lock profiles will be much more useful than with 8-bit. And I also created a new LUT pack especially made for S-Lock and HLG profiles. If you are interested in that the link is down below in the description and I appreciate any support. With this camera I gave S-Lock 2 and 3 a chance to see if it actually will work for me and my workflow. And I must say it is definitely more usable than on the A7 III. But I could still experience more grain in the shadow areas with the S-Lock than with the HLG or the standard profile. And if you don't use any LUTs to create the S-Lock footage, the process of color grading can be really tricky and time consuming, especially for beginners. Because first you have to heavily add contrast and saturation to the footage, and then you can add a look on top of that. So I still got stuck with using HLG3 on this camera instead. HLG3 still gives you enough dynamic range while obtaining some contrast and saturation to see which direction the final image will look like. But if you want to have the flattest image possible to match with other cameras, go for S-Log3. Here's a pro tip. If you are using any flat profile like S-Log or HLG on this camera, turn on the Gamma Display Assist. You will find that in the menu on the display options. Like this, the camera previews the image with a lot more contrast and saturation as if you would use a lot input inside your camera. There's no surprise here. The standard in-body image stabilization is working like the ones from the previous A7 models. You only get the benefit of using a new active mode where the camera crops in to 10% in order to stabilize the image via software. For handheld shooting this works really good but for gimbal work I would only use the center mode. But let's talk about the new gyro stabilization of this camera. It's not a unique feature of the A7 S3. Also the much cheaper cameras like the a7c and the cv1 have that feature but how it works is that the gyro data will be recorded to the video footage and later on in sony catalyst browse you can add a software-based stabilization please be aware that this feature does not work in certain frame rates and bit rates it won't work above 60 fps or with the 420 10-bit codecs and it will only work with a high shutter speed, so you won't have any motion blur. If you're using the gyro stabilization with heavy shakes and some motion blur, you won't get good results. It also crops heavily into your footage, so keep that in mind. So here's my conclusion. The Sony a7S III is the video-based DSLM we've been waiting for years. And as Sony said, it would succeed our expectations. All I wanted was 4K 60p with 10-bit internal recording and now we got it up to 120p in 10-bit. This is a serious filmmaker's tool and it shoots photos too, which a normal cinema camera doesn't. For Instagram, 12 megapixels are more than enough and the image quality out of the A7S III is absolutely awesome. But for wedding and landscape photography, you will need more than 12 megapixels. If the A7S III would have at least 20 megapixels, I might have sold my A7S III already. At the end of the day, you can't have it all. Okay, the features and functions are excellent. Let's look at the price. In Europe, you can get your copy for a whopping 4,200 euros and in the US for $3,500. Is it overpriced? Well, I think in Europe it definitely is. I know in the US there are different taxes, but right now 4,200 euros are around 5,150 US dollars. And that huge price difference can't be just to do taxes. For the A7S II back then you only paid 3,500 euros. And if you're still doing a lot of photography work, you can't just sell your A7 III and only use one body instead. If your main purpose is to capture videos and you're making a living out of it, don't 
don't hesitate and take that investment. You will have a camera that's future-proof for the next three to four years. You will be happy with it and your clients will be too. But if you're only capturing videos from time to time and you're still heavily related on the photo side or you're just starting out with your business and you already have an a7 III, there's my advice. A better camera doesn't make you a better videographer. I used the a7 III for three years now and did a lot of video work with it. Most of the videos ended up on social media. And the truth is I got really great quality out of the a7 III and even with my a6300 back then. If the majority of people are consuming your videos on a smartphone display, you often cannot tell the difference between a Sony a7 III or an a7S III. But if you play a video in 4K, even on YouTube and you watch it on a big screen, you will definitely see a difference between true 4K and 1080p upscaled videos. So for color grading, the 10-bit footage is definitely a big argument for upgrading. But with this, also keep in mind, you will need to invest into new SD cards. And maybe you also need to upgrade your editing machine. So even if you're just starting out with commercial video shootings, don't rush into things. And think about it twice, if you really need this upgrade. Because you also need to return that investment. And if your clients are happy with what they got until now, you may first save some money or rent the camera for some shootings before upgrading to a new body. So I hope you like my video. If you have any questions, leave them down below. I will try to answer them. Please stay healthy and see you in my next video.